People in a little traffic this morning, it took a little longer to get here than you wanted, maybe a few of you. Our next speaker flew here from Australia. So uh, maybe you know, take it with a grain of salt. We are very lucky and honored to have uh, Dr. Jody Oakman joining us today. Uh, she's the leader of the Center for Ergonomics and Human Factors at Latrobe University, uh, which I'm sure she'll speak a little bit about, and has developed the Affirm tool, a, particip a participatory hazard identification and risk management toolkit, which again, we may hear a little bit about today. Please join me in welcoming all the way from Australia, Dr. Jody Oakman. some challenges. Thank you for that welcome. Um, yes, every time I get on a plane, I, Australia's big. Like Canada, it takes four hours to get to the other side. So um, yes, it was a, a long way, but uh, the airline was kind to me and everything was on time. So anyway, I'm here. We won't think about what time it is in Australia and I'm awake. So <laughs> <laughs> my job now is to keep you awake. So. Um, um, it's great to be here in person. It's, it's always uh, exciting to be in a room where people are talking about one of my favourite topics, musculoskeletal disorders, and I'm going to talk about mental health as well. And really what we need to do, what I think, or what the evidence is telling us, that we need to do to reduce the prevalence of these significant occupational health and safety problems. Um, and I, wanted, I want to encourage you to think about why we need to integrate those two and bring those things together. Um, you have a much better understanding than I do of your legislation and, and regulations, and we've heard a little bit about that today. Um, but I think, um, I think one of the things is that they will encourage us to do the minimum, and I think the best practice approach uh, is what we should be striving for. Right. So I'm going to start by talking about work in general because I think that's uh, an important focus for us to, to keep. Why are we working? And work holds different meanings for different people. And so if we're going to think about effective strategies that support individuals and communities in their work when we're addressing musculoskeletal disorders, it, realises, it relies on us thinking about what the differences are and the differences in those contexts and the different meanings for why people actually work. And I think the really important message is that there isn't a universal rule book. And so we need to actually tailor our approaches depending on what, what we're doing and who we're actually working with. And so the theme today, past, present and future, provides a really valuable lens for thinking about what um, we've done in the past and how it's changed and how our practice in occupational health and safety and ergonomics needs to adapt. And this reflection is really important, I think, because it's one of the, um, one of the parts about being a, a, a professional uh, and it, it allows us to uh, analyse recurring patterns, what are the critical issues and address ongoing challenges and whether um, they're long-standing or newly emerging and we certainly have plenty of those. And so this rapid change of work, is, we may get discouraged about what the, the issue of MSDs and why does this remain unresolved. Uh, our knowledge to address that has certainly um, expanded, but in some ways our um, interventions have failed to take um, some of that evidence into practice. So I'm going to talk about the big picture first. Um, at a macro level, it's helpful for us to think about these industrial revolutions and the significant historical changes that workers and workplaces have been. So the first three industrial revolutions are well known to us and we probably all have visions about what that's been like. But the fourth is just revealing and maybe you have the fifth, but I'm not going to go into that, um, uh, that today. Um, and I'm just going to take a little uh, trip through that to get us thinking about what work uh, has been and, and, and what it is today. 
So the first industrial revolution from the mid-1700s to mid-1800s saw the transition from hand to machine production, powered by steam and water. This so revolutionised industries like textiles and iron and contributed to major societal change. Dickensian factories and child labourers are probably what we have often think of. And the second revolution in the 1870s to uh, 1914 saw electricity, railroads, telegraph, powering the transformation of work and society further, and the first modern production line. And Henry Ford's first moving assembly line, so where's Alison? She's not, I can't see her there, there she is. Uh, yeah. You did. <laughs> well, well, I made a little part, because I also worked at Ford uh, back in the day. Uh, I happened to drive past the uh, one of the, uh, we now don't have manufacturing in Australia, and I hadn't been past the factory, it was really quite, quite uh, uh, sad. So, I'm sure there are others that have probably worked at Ford as well. Okay. This is somewhat challenging me, though. Mm, sorry. Yeah. I said I wasn't going to need the back button, didn't I? All right. <laughs> Sorry. So, um, the third industrial revolution is much more familiar to us, beginning in the 1950s and considered as the move from mechanical and analogue electronic te technology to digital electronics. Internet rap and rapid advances in information technology shifted our global economy from one focused on and driven by digital processes. And this quickly changed our lives in unimaginable ways, significant consequences for how we work and opening up possibilities for where and how work can be undertaken. Landline, anyone here remember that? Made way for the mobile and then the smartphone. And many of us have been glued to our screens ever since. If that wasn't enough to get head round, just to, we're now entering, or we're in, the fourth industrial revolution. So the fourth. The concept of the fourth industrial revolution was popularised by the founder of um, World Economic Forum, Klaus Schwab, in 2016. Building on the recent developments of the digital revolution, this is... This uh, revolution is distinguished by its rapid pace and wide-ranging impact and potential to disrupt industries and economies in all corners of the globe. Characterised by automation, data exchange and systems like AI. It's hard to give a presentation about work now without mentioning AI. The Internet of Things, cloud computing and robotics. And it's translating... Um, into a rapid and profound transformation, manufacturing, global businesses, and not to mention the way we live. It's already giving rise to many new challenges for ergonomists and health and safety professionals, and despite the rhetoric human, that humans may soon be removed from workplaces altogether, I think we've got a little way to go. So, we've had all this rapid change in just 250 years, and in particular, the last 15 years have been... Um, you know, really significant change, but there are some really common themes that still remain in terms of work. People before me today have talked about this, um, this issue about the uh, focus that we have on the wrong end of the MSD problem. And in, um, so I won't um, dwell on that too much, but it's one of the challenges in, in the stubborn problem of MSDs is this issue about focusing on the downstream factors. We rely on clinical diagnoses and the reliability of these is often poor. And apologies to the prof uh, clinicians in the room. In workplaces, diagnoses don't matter. It's actually what people can do. We need to focus on worker capacity and capability. Um, the, one of the, um, the issues too is, is the sorting out what's actually aggravating the issues which needs greater scrutiny. And I'll put a plug here for actually regular hazard surveillance of psychosocial and physical workplace hazards. And I'll say that probably about 10 more times today. So, just a warning. So, the issue around what causes MSDs is not, is not new. We've focused, we know about the physical factors and that fits with our mental model of a physical problem caused by physical, um, physical hazards. The issue and the role of psychosocial factors is getting a lot more traction now, and certainly in my own country, the recent introduction of psychosocial hazard regulation in some states, not my own. Um, 
has put has, has lifted the focus on psychosocial hazards, but not necessarily in MSD prevention. It's helping, but we still have this um, in some uh, this challenge around convincing people about this dual um, exposures uh, in relation to MSDs. So these models here, um, you know, go back from the um, the 80s and, and early 2001, and I don't need to tell people in the room about the National Re um, Research Council model. You'll have probably all seen that in places and how, um, I'll say revolutionary that was, given that it came from the States in that early 2000 period, and then some of our own models. So we know what the problem is. We know that these uh, psychosocial factors and hazards uh, and physical hazards are responsible for uh, musculoskeletal disorders. But the challenge lies in actually using that evidence to drive our practice and convince those in our workplaces who need to be convinced that they need to do things differently in most cases. Uh, and in some cases, um, we have seen some, some changes. I'll say there are some workplaces uh, that I work with that um, uh, are, are trying. So psychosocial hazards, there is a long list. What do we mean by psychosocial hazards? Um, it's much longer than the list that I have here, but it's a large and very diverse uh, group of hazards. And that, in some ways, contributes to the challenges that we have. People uh, find uh, it difficult to understand what's, what are the psychosocial hazards that are relevant for their particular workplaces, and then they struggle with what to do about uh, about those hazards, and I'll come back to that uh, in a minute. But put simply, a workplace psychosocial hazard is anything that can cause um, psychological harm or physical harm, including anxiety, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, sleep disorders. And the common, most common psychosocial hazards that we see commonly in workplace are the things around job demands, how much control people have, how much support, the physical environment, ina inadequate reward and recognition. It's a very long list. Not, that's not exhaustive, and there are many models that support different iterations of those particular hazards. Physical hazards are a more contained list, and I'll come back to that when I talk about our tool a little bit, but a more contained list, so we can... Um, um, uh, we need less measures to cover them more comprehensively. But why does this matter? I think we've heard today about some of those the um, insurance costs and the, the numbers and, you know, perhaps the slow decline of, of, of MSDs. But it matters because MSDs impact people's ability to work. Um, and as we know, we've got an ageing population, so the requirement for us to work for longer, whether we <laughs> like that uh, thought or not, uh, is there. Uh, and so maintaining good uh, workability, the, the ability to sustain employment across the life course, um, is really, really important. Now, this is my little plug to here about the woeful state of funding for occupational health. Um, that despite the low back pain is one of the leading causes of, it, of years lost to disability. And so it really impacts a people's ability to work. So this is not only a problem for the person, but it's actually a societal burden and a really significant burden. Because if a person can't work, then someone else, us in the room, have to support that person in some way. Medical co um, costs, pension costs, compensation, take your pick. So it's really important in framing that using that sort of socio-technical systems uh, approaches that Richard spoke about this morning. So this global burden of disease data is really, I think, insightful in helping us to think about where we should pri be prioritising uh, some of our, um, our research and our research funding. Um, and uh, we focus much more on communicable diseases and much less on non-communicable diseases such as low back pain. I'm just going to talk a little bit about a case study that um, any Amazon people work for Amazon or how it works? I'm sure there must be someone. Yeah, okay, so it's all right. <laughs> all of this, <laughs> all of this <laughs> information is publicly available, so there's nothing. No, uh, no, you've probably got more secrets than I do here. So, um, 
you can come up and share them. So Amazon is a really good modern day example of psychosocial hazards in, in today's workplace. It's a large global company, um, many uh, empires and plentiful examples of physical and mental health issues in a modern warehouse environment, so shiny and, and new. And we think of warehouses often, you know, we've moved a long way from the sort of dark, cramped ones that I talked about um, in, in earlier um, centuries. But Amazon's a massive employer in Canada. I have 45,000. So he's making me a little nervous now because he's right in my eye. Like he's thinking, no, that's not right. But anyway, <laughs> that's, what, uh, that's what's available. Um, and in the US, it's also, you know, it's one of the largest private employers and in, in, in globally, including Australia, it employs nearly one and a half million people across the globe mostly in, in warehouse and delivery workers, and their working conditions are really anything but optimal because the priority in Amazon is, is speed over safety. So one of the things they do with these, you know, modern technologies is that you can, you know, uh, put hazard surveillance things, which is not the sort of surveillance I was talking about. They put surveillance and collects the data on individual workers' productivity, so on their work rate, ta task time, how long they're idle, and this leads to practices which are less than ideal. And so there are many groups which have tried to um, have you know, greater scrutiny on the sort of um, and improvements to try and um, instigate improvements to Amazon's workplace safety and treatment of employees. There's plenty of global media reports on the company's inhumane practices that are really detrimental to the sorts of things that in this room we're striving to change. Despite the public information being available, this hasn't dented their profit margins, so it's not you know, changing um, consumer behaviour. Um, and in a recent study, um, by Illinois, uh, in, sorry, University of Illinois in Chicago, it highlighted some of these outcomes. They're very broad statistics for my liking, but anyway, nearly half of workers reported that they weren't able to take breaks, nearly half felt that they were monitored, uh, and nearly half took time off that was unpaid. And I think that's always really telling because people don't take unpaid um, time off unless they're really desperate. So I think, and, and many of the Amazon workers don't have the rights and protections because they're not on um, you know, permanent contracts or they've got zero hours contracts. And here, um, I don't need to talk to you here about the number of injuries that, that actually specifically Amazon in Canada have, but suffice to say a lot. Uh, with very significant compensation costs um, and not improving by the data that I have available. Um, and the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, which permeates many of, of um, our workplaces, has done and will continue to, saw um, an increase in employees and a subsequent increase in the number of claims. So, yes, it's a... Um, uh, it's a, a modern day, you know, Dickensian sort of work uh, environment. So a really good example of how what is um, often thought of as physical work, working in, in those sorts of environments, but actually the problems that are emerging are actually related to the psychosocial hazards that will focus on, um, on delivery and speed. So just to shift tack a little bit, one of the um, issues that we have often in uh, workplaces, particularly when we have such as the Amazon example, we have um, an expectation that the sorts of issues you're going to see in, in uh, Amazon are around musculoskeletal disorders. And so the focus is probably likely to be on dealing with the physical hazards of work. Um, and may or may not um, include the psychosocial hazards. To try and, um, shall we say, attempt to negate or, or explore further about this relative um, effect sizes of physical versus psychosocial hazards, most people will say, well, the physical hazards will be worse. We uh, undertook a review of um, studies which had measured both physical and psychosocial hazards 
and then reported both. And I'm being very careful about saying that because that's actually more difficult than you would think because many studies might measure both and then they, for whatever reason, go and report them separately. And for this purpose, that wasn't going to work for us. So um, what we were interested in was th only those studies where they measured um, both. This is not publicly available at the moment. Um, but what we, what we had to do was actually look at the uh, physical hazards and the psychosocial hazards. I said, um, uh, I said that the grouping of psychosocial hazards uh, before is actually very challenging because there are many more of them and there are many different ways people measure them. Uh, for the biomechanical hazards, relatively straightforward. So what happens when you, you have to... Um, we, we uh, used a framework to actually group those and I'm not, I don't have time today to go into the detail of that and hopefully one day you can read the paper. Um, but we did find uh, significant impacts of physical and psychosocial hazards, but perhaps not in the way that I would have liked it to be presented. So if you can see that data up there, the lines that are further away from the vertical one mean a stronger association. So in fact, the, for many of the different body parts, the, the physical hazards were in fact more significant. So for the naysayers in the room, they go, well, that's, that's done then. You've, you've just shown that physical hazards are more important. But it's not that straightforward, thankfully. <laughs> oh, um, because one of the challenges is that the way psychosocial me hazards are measured differs widely and we have to do a, put a, a, a grouping together. But also many of the important psychosocial factors for MSDs were actually missing. So things like some of the leadership measures, some of the emotional demands which have been shown in the literature to be important, weren't actually in the studies that we were able to include in this review. So watch this space. So one of the challenges, just leading on from that, is the issue around what people can use in workplaces to measure psychosocial hazards and physical hazards together. Because if we take my argument that you need to do both, the tools need to reflect that. Um, so, in this review, we we're interested in the tools available for use by workplace practitioners to address both physical and psychosocial hazards together. And many of the tools, quite rightly, measure um, particular aspects of work, which has a place. But if we're actually talking about a comprehensive risk management strategy, we need to use tools that measure uh, jobs and not just tasks. So, when we undertook uh, this review, um, we were interested in um, looking at all the tools available and then um, condensing that down to only the tools that were what we defined as comprehensive. So they measured both physical and psychosocial hazards and they gave resources to workplace practitioners and professionals to help them in once they've identified what the hazards are, then doing something about it. Because many of the tools for psychosocial hazards are not freely available, and if they are freely available, they diagnose what the problem is, but they don't actually provide resources to help workplaces go, well, what do I do with this now? So, what we found in that review, that there are actually only three tools, this is worldwide, that um, uh, met our definition of comprehensive, and they were um, the Affirm Toolkit, which we developed at La Trobe University, uh, RAMP and the NASA TLX um, to a certain extent. The Affirm, and this is difficult without, you know, I'll um, blow my own, our own trumpet here, but ours is the most comprehensive tool. That is, it measures the greatest range of psychosocial hazards um, compared to the others. Anyway, let's take a little... Um, uh, detour, and I'll come back to the Affirm Toolkit uh, in a bit. So, thinking about some of these limitations and the sort of unresolved issues, uh, we can feel disheartened, but there are, you know, some bright spots. And one of the things that um, is emerging is um, some legislation around the right to disconnect. Um, and we know that uh, in, uh, certainly in COVID, there were some challenges about disconnection because we 
we really had no boundaries for anything, really. Um, and certainly um, in, uh, in Australia, uh, this has led to some recent um, legislation, which I'll, I'll talk about. So we, the increased focus, um, we've seen an increased focus in um, the psychosocial hazards and mental health space. And one of the things that has arisen to that, arisen from that, is this new um, right to disconnect uh, legislation. Um, it, uh, there is some recent publicly available um, uh, study recently published in, a, in, in the conversation, um, which said that many of us uh, are at risk, high risk of work addiction through not being able to disconnect from our workplaces. And um, that we were clocking up to five hours of unpaid um, after hours work every week, which I actually thought was rather modest, but regardless. Um, this availability creep um, is, has a cost to us as individuals at about 10,000 Canadian in um, your um, money. Um, and one of, the one of the problems is around this sort of work-life interaction space um, and our always, uh, the, the always-on culture leading to a range of health issues like burnout, headaches, insomnia, back pain. So we've got this new legislation which came into um, space in um, August of this year around um, setting boundaries for businesses that have got 15 or more employees. Um, as you can see, it's too new to really uh, have evaluated, but we're not the first country to have actually um, uh, developed that um, legislation. In fact, you here have some that was came out in 2022 and should be better placed to speak than mine. Well, so, one of the challenges, uh, and I think so, France were actually the first country to introduce that legislation in 2017. They're often at the forefront of bringing in sort of what we consider radical uh, changes. You know, they have limits to, to working hours and those sorts of things. But there are some questions, I think, to uh, reflect on about whether or not legislation is actually the answer here. Because sometimes by putting in place rigid controls, we can actually make situations worse for people. If you talk to any academic, if you said you had to stop um, when you, you know, were in the middle of something, then you, that might actually make it worse for them than actually being able to, uh, you know, to continue to, to, to finish. So anyway, there's some interesting, I think, reflections when we try and use legislation to fix a problem without perhaps thinking about why the problem exists in the first place. And so my, um, you know, my, this is my argument for, for using a, a complex systems or a socio-technical systems approach, which actually allows to think of all the different influences on that particular problem. Uh, and then we can start to think about what are the sort of levers that we want to push or pull to drive some change. So, I'm going to talk about um, our Affirm toolkit that we developed um, in Australia. Um, this work began uh, before I came to the university, back in the sort of mid 2000s, um, and really um, took, we really uh, got some traction, shall I say, in 2010. Now, anyone that's been in the room, working with regulators, know that patience is the name of the game. Um, I don't think that when I started doing this in 2010, I really thought that we'd be f finished, you know, fixed, that, that would be done in a couple of years. I'm now a little more worldly wise and I understand that uh, we have to walk with them. Um, and I'm pleased to say that um, when we started this work, we were really trying to push uh, the inclusion of psychosocial hazards in guidance material for MSDs, um, in training of, you know, inspectors to go out and look at these uh, different things, and that was really difficult. Um, now, regulators are much more amenable um, to that discussion, and in fact, the WorkSafe uh, Victoria, from where I'm from, she has a web page for this tool, so I consider that that is one of my... 
um, career highlights. I never thought that a web page would be so exciting. But it's, it's uh, an indication that there is progress, I think, in, in this space. So Affirm's one of the comprehensive tools that I uh, alluded to before, um, and we developed it. It's in, in its, when we started, it was really to try and shift the bar in workplace practice in how MSDs were being managed. So, and we, we knew, I'm a, I was a workplace practitioner at Ford and many other places for a long time before I came to academia. So we knew that we needed to really step, provide support for workplaces in being able to do that. And I think one of the most challenging things about putting in place a comprehensive approach, whether it's a firm or whatever other tool, is actually getting that buy-in at the first stage. We now say, we do training for the uh, Affirm Toolkit and we, we very early in the training say, if you can't get buy-in in the workplaces, then don't start. It's actually worse to um, try and implement this, get workers engaged and excited and then have it fall over. Wait, put your efforts in trying to bring the organisation along and then, um, and then start. So when we, the toolkit was developed um, based on a WHO healthy workplace model. Uh, we were a WHO collaborating centre um, back when we were doing this work. We are uh, not now. Um, and it uses a risk management approach because the other thing that we wanted to do was to develop something that was familiar to workplaces so that they knew the sort of steps that they needed to go through. Um, and so that they would be comfortable um, in understanding what they needed to do and, and how to actually do that. It's very, um, stay, it's a, it takes a staged approach, provides resources at every step. And um, as I said, the two steps, well, getting started and plan and prepare, are the most um, challenging for, for workplaces. The survey, um, there is a, a survey which is a key part, a central part of actually driving the processes that happen within the toolkit because it, it actually uses worker participation to actually identify what those hazards are and then get feedback from them on unpacking why they actually occur. So that's, um, it's, it, 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 participation is embedded in it without a participative hazard identification and, and uh, risk management toolkit at firm. That's why we shortened it, because it's too long to keep repeating. Um, and we, um, it measures two categories, if we want to think about it that way, the physical or manual handling hazards and these things called psychosocial hazards. And we include uh, psychosocial hazards that are about the organisation of work and job design and those that are about the social context, so those relationships, your supervisors, no, sorry, wrong way, supervisors and, uh, and workers, communication and, um, uh, and other sort of other relationships in the workplace. There are 59 um, hazard, uh, hazards, 12, psych uh, sorry, 12 physical and the rest psychosocial. You ask, well, that's really unbalanced um, and that's true um, but what we're looking at is the relationship between those hazards and the outcomes and the reason there are more psychosocial hazards I hope now is um, is obvious because there are many more that need to be measured we could measure more but that would make a survey that was untenable or take too long in workplaces and so we pay attention between doing as a researcher Bring them all in, it's no problem. But we're actually, our focus is on um, workplaces and what workplaces can actually do. So this survey, in a different presentation, I'd get you all to do it and you could see what, what happens and I could present the report, but um, it wasn't enough time. You can come to Australia. I'm doing a workshop in Perth <laughs> next week and one in Brisbane at the end of the year. If you're interested, it'll be winter here, it'll be very hot in Brisbane in November. But um, uh, very welcome. It's on our website, so you can have a look. Um, so we measure pain and discomfort as a risk indicator. Uh, 
five body regions, frequency and severity, uh, and, and give it a score. And we measure stress-related mental health. So when we started the toolkit, we were trying to change practice around MSD prevention, and we deliberately kept it just focused on the MSDs and not stress-related mental health. We, um, uh, we were very specific about that, even though it would make sense, because the psychosocial hazards that are related to MSDs or are potentially related to MSDs, of course, can cause mental health uh, issues. So you say, well, why didn't we just include a mental health outcome? Um, and we we decided not to because we really wanted to try and drive that change at the regulator. I said that actually working with the regulator was, was really um, tough in those days. Um, in 2020, the regulator came to us and said, why don't you include a stress-related mental health outcome in a firm? And we went, oh, OK. If you're, um, they were willing to help. And we undertook um, a project, which for anyone, Canadians will understand. So the project was approved in 2020. Uh, in manufacturing, we, we undertook a, um, so that was the start of COVID. And Melbourne was the most locked down city in the world. Uh, as not ideal to be trying to do um, intervention style research. So um, this project was, that was really tough and a testament to um, one of my colleagues who was um, uh, really persevered in getting the data to, to drive this sort of change. So this new version of the toolkit allows you to either choose musculoskeletal disorders or um, stress-related mental health and musculoskeletal disorders, depending on what your focus is. Oh, I should say, these 12 items on stress are drawn from the COPSOC Copenhagen Psychosocial Questionnaire. And we use the same principle as for MSDs, we score, and we look at the relationship between the hazards, those 59 items, and the, and the outcome. So I'll just stick, um, the toolkit has a very, um, uh, say, clear um, platform so that you can act. Of course, I'm going to say it's clear. Uh, other people tell us it's clear. Work workplaces uh, report back. They like it because everything's in the one place. They can see. And there is lots and lots of resources and information uh, included. But um, a workplace can be doing a number of different assessments in different places, and they can see all of these um, here. Just going to show you just a couple of snapshots of the re reports and um, toolkit's freely available so if you're interested in using it you just need to register and um, you can um, uh, hop in and have a look. So um, as soon when the survey um, uh, I said the survey is the sort of first stage of the uh, the toolkit you'll note this QR code just a little aside, in 2019, the developers said, do you want a QR code? And we went, I don't know. Do we want <laughs> sure, we'll have a QR code. No, I, you know, call me ignorant, but in 2019, I wasn't using a lot of QR codes. I, yes, after um, COVID, we were all very comfortable and the QR code has proved one of the really, has proved to be very popular with workplaces in getting, um, you know, making it easy for people to get the survey, um, distribute the survey link. So when you finish the, um, the survey, in about one minute, the reporting will come up. So it's very, it's, it's very quick. Um, and it'll tell you about who's got, how many people have got pain and discomfort in the work group you're doing. And it'll tell you what those hazards are. And it'll split the hazards by uh, those related to MSDs and those related to mental health. And of course, there will be some overlap. Um, and I often get questions about, well, how come, why is there overlap? And I explain that, of course, um, the exposures for the physical and the, ment uh, sorry, for the MSDs and the stress-related mental health, uh, they're in the same work environment. So um, I go back to, to basics and, uh, and, and explain that. And sometimes we see physical hazards causing mental health 
uh, issues. So it's um, sometimes challenging for people to shift away from the, um, the sort of more linear, linear thinking about what causes what. So, um, and uh, all of the data in the, is in the, uh, the toolkit and all the data that you record when you're looking at what the hazards are and developing your risk management plan. The ultimate aim, of course, is to get workplaces to develop high quality risk controls that are really targeting those, uh, the highest level that they can. So trying to lift them away from training of workers in how to lift and get them thinking about some of those job design, well, basically using the data to tell them what to, to use. And we have a, a guide to really try and lift that thinking um, away from an individual focus on fi fixing the worker and up into that sort of organisational space. So there's just some more examples. I just thought I'd show you briefly who's using the toolkit. So we've had, um, we have many people, many more people register, have a look and go, probably that's gonna be too hard for us. Um, we've had about 7,000 individual survey responses across different workplaces. Um, and uh, for those of you who can read that, health, health and social assistance, there are many more, and that's probably something to do with our uh, relationships and also some of the projects that we've had have been in healthcare. So there was not surprising that there's more of those, but equally we've had mining and uh, manufacturing use um, the toolkit successfully. I just wanted to show you um, a little bit about, um, so the, the, the toolkit is designed for practitioners and um, professionals to use. At the back end, we can see the raw data, we can't see those reports and those uh, sorts of things. Um, but, you know, we're, a, we're also a research unit, so we need to, to, to sustain the sort of ongoing um, development of the toolkit. We need to do research things with the data. And we're interested in looking at the different profiles. When we looked at all the data we had, um, and I won't go into a big uh, discussion about um, latent profile analysis, because that will send everyone to sleep. But essentially, the three lines there are different hazard groups. So um, people in, in low uh, work, or people reporting low hazards, high hazards, and somewhere in the middle. On the left is the physical hazards, and on the right, of the psychosocial constructs. And if you just see at a very basic level, the differentiation between the physical, the physical lines are much closer together and the psychosocial hazards down the end are much uh, spread further apart. And that's actually uh, a significant uh, result. The low um, hazard people have much lower musculoskeletal pain score, about seven. And the high ones have, um, is, is about 17. But what that tells us, well, well, what our, um, our in interrogation of that data and our understanding in the Australian context is that these are lots of these are large employers. So they employ, you know, upwards of 100, 150 people. Um, and there's been a lot of focus from the regulators on preventing MSDs through the physical means. So lots of them have done a lot of work in that space. And so if you were looking at this and going, well, what, where am I going to get my biggest bang for my buck next? You go the psychosocial hazards because you've got space there to reduce, you've got opportunity, I should say, to reduce those high hazard groups to bring them closer down to the, the, the low. So that's the two-minute explanation of our latent profile analysis. There is a paper that you can read if you're, um, int if you're interested in uh, reading more about that. I've got about three minutes, let's go, all right. So if you're interested in some practical examples of the toolkit, there is a, um, uh, uh, some case studies um, funded by the regulator, so clearly we're friends now, and they're um, um, you know, happy with the uh, a firm toolkit. But in the, um, there are four or five case studies um, uh, in, the, in this book, they're on our, um, on our website. Um, and I'm just going to give you a couple of key takeaways about what actually worked for organisations. Um, 
And what, what it helped was it helped organisations that were really ready to take a different approach. So we're looking to do something, but they didn't know what. And so we gave them the toolkit. Um, they had senior management uh, were well briefed and on board, and they used the toolkit to help them with that. Um, it helped when they had a good represent, re representation of workers, health and safety reps, union where appropriate, on what's called the risk management team, which is the team that drives the whole process. What didn't go well is when it was imposed on a business unit, so that it was just told, here, here's this thing, you go and do it, sort that out. Or when the organisation was not ready, so those ones that they were, they were, they just weren't in the headspace where they were ready to to, to say we're going to we're going to manage our psychosocial and physical hazards together. So we're going to include our mental health and and um, MSDs in the one prevention program. So then it didn't go so well. And then when they had organisations with the usual things like lack of commitment um, and um, poor communication of the, of the process. So, just in closing, we've had this whistle-stop tour. I hope everyone's still awake. Um, as you've seen through our brief journey through these four industrial revolutions and the work practices have changed beyond measure, but there are psychosocial hazards still exist. They did exist and they still exist, and they're not new. So the increase in technology and automation has reduced some of the physical loads, but it's imposed some new hazards um, that, such as the case with Amazon, that we need to think about how we're going to equip ourselves and our workplaces that we work with to deal with. Some jobs have changed a lot and some haven't changed that much. And workers in traditional and more contemporary jobs face a range of complex physical and psychosocial hazards. Uh, and aware, although the awareness of the psychosocial hazards in MSDs has grown, some of our preventative strategies have not kept pace with that knowledge. And you see, this is not new. We've known about this for a long time. So I just want to, I guess my call to action is that everyone engaged in prevention, so regulators, ergonomists, health and safety professionals, workplaces, needs to think about what their prevention strategies are and are they actually using evidence to drive those, um, those prevention programs. Thank you.